And today, as we uh, come into this, uh, I want us to think over the theme of peace today. As we, we often talk about Jesus as being the Prince of Peace, but why do we call Him the Prince of Peace? In a world that seems full of turmoil. You know, I want us to look in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it or perform this. Here as we come into this passage, you know, we sing about Jesus being the Prince of Peace. And yet we look around us and we, we think... That, that other hymn, the one that says, Hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Why did an author write that? Because right now we have a hundred and some thousand troops along the edge of Ukraine as Russia is looking at doing something. As in the South China Sea, we see navies from around the entire world have been showing a show of force telling another country, China, do not invade and attack Taiwan. And so there have been all kinds of shows of force in the last few weeks going on and actually throughout the year as uh, things have been mounting and increasing around the world. You and I live in a day and age where unfortunately in 2020 we have seen domestic abuse go up by 25 to 30 percent in 2020. And as we think of that from 2019 to 2020, those numbers came in. Murder is up, sorry, murder is up 25 to 30 percent. Violence, aggravated assaults, it was 12 percent. So I, I mixed up those two. 12 percent for that, for aggravated assault. Mental health issues have been on the rise through the pandemic. And truly, this, this song, Hate is Strong, and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. There is not peace in the world right now. You know, many pray and pray for peace. But there will be no peace until the Prince of Peace comes back to set up his kingdom. He came to offer a legitimate kingdom of peace, but man did not want it. Instead, they crucified him. So what did he offer? He offered peace with God. And it starts spiritually. He took care of a spiritual problem by becoming a spiritual sacrifice in which Jesus stepped into our humanity to take your death penalty and mine. So he might save us so that one day we can enjoy, like the sign on the wall, peace on earth. That we can enjoy the tidings of the angels, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That we can look and see what Isaiah says here, that unto us a son is given, he is everlasting, and he is the prince of peace. You and I want to enjoy all the fullness of that. You know, atheists often argue against Christianity and say, because there's evil in the world, there must not be a good God. That is one of their arguments that they like to constantly bring up. But the problem, I want you to think, put your thinking cap on with me for a moment. The very fact that atheists and skeptics would say that things are not right they're not like they should or supposed to be. Hence that there is a moral consciousness within man that says something went wrong. And it's, it's in the heart of every man that this is not right. It's not right to murder. It's not right to abuse. It's not right to do these things. Why do we have that moral consciousness? Because God put within every man a conscience, a moral alarm system that goes off. Because God did not create us this way, amen? He created us not to love evil and to love what is wrong. He originally created us in innocence back in the garden. The fact that man used his freedom to vandalize God's good world with sin is admission of really 
clearly what has taken place and an understanding. The world has a moral consciousness that this world's condition is not right. And so we want to look to the moral lawgiver, Jesus Christ. And I want us to look here in Isaiah 9, 6. Notice that the Son is given, He is born, and the government shall be upon His shoulder, and His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Did you notice that the government will be on His shoulder? What government is that? Uh, look in verse 7. And of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. When will this take place? Well, to order it in, uh, sorry, upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. Ah, there we have it. Now we know when this takes place. It's when King Jesus sits upon the throne of David, which is a future promise after the tribulation period when he ushers in his kingdom in person. And God will set up tent with us. He will be God with us. And you and I will enjoy his revealed presence. Not just the fact that He saves us as sinners and gives us eternal life, but rather He gives us more than just that. He gives us His presence in that day. You know, you and I see Jesus hasn't set up His kingdom on the earth right now. He's not upon the throne of David. Jesus does provide real peace, and that is through the person of His Son and His death for us. You know, how do you find peace? Well, today I want us to consider this. You must trust Jesus as God's only person vision for real for real peace as we uh, look into our passage our first point that I want us to consider is this that Jesus is the Prince of Peace because number one everyone tragically is guilty of having broken off their relationship with God through your sin. So look, if you would, back in Genesis, Genesis 3. You know the story. There was a good part of the story that was just so enjoyable. There was a day when God walked with man here on the earth. Genesis 3, 8 says this, and this is speaking of Adam and Eve, and they, they had earlier walked in Genesis 3 in the cool of the garden with the Lord Jesus. They'd enjoyed His presence, but something happened. It says verse 7, their eyes were opened after they sinned. They ate of the forbidden fruit in verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God said, called to Adam and, eat, and said to them, to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Why would man hide from God? I thought things were good between Adam and Eve. It was until sin took place. You see, in, earlier in the, the book, in Genesis, we see that they used to walk together. They enjoyed each other's company. God could walk in man's, or man could walk in God's presence because there was no sin. After this, Adam knew, I have to veil myself. Things are not right. And so here we see that, that the difficulty and the weightiness of that took place. Turn over to Romans chapter 3, would you please? Romans 3. The Bible says that in Romans 3, verse 8 through 10... And why not? Let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and some affirm that we say their condemnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks, and they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. If we were to keep reading, we would see in verse 10 through 18, there is none there is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. 
Their throat is like an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. It goes on, verse 17, And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God in their eyes. Verse 23, For all, that's every one of us, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, the standard for heaven was perfection, but none of us made it. And God's like, you have all fallen short of God's standard of how to get into heaven. You can't get in there by good works. You can't get in there by the Ten Commandments because none of you can keep all Ten Commandments perfectly. You're, you are by nature and by choice a sinner. Now, I want us to think about something. Turn over to Romans chapter uh, 5, verse 12. Chapter 5, verse 12, it says this, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Today, I've got in my hands a, a nice thing of purified water. and it tastes good. It's good, fresh. But if I take this thing as salt, now I know some of you gargle with salt water, but uh, if I start pouring this in here, and this is kind of like a picture of your sin. I, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, have you just done one sin? I mean, let's think about this a little bit. Let's be honest, all right? Have you ever lied a few times? A lot. Have you ever stolen? Have you ever gotten a fight? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> have you ever thought bad thoughts, mean thoughts, snarky thoughts? Oh, no. <laughs> That's the whole bottle. Um, have you ever had any of those things? How? Anybody want a drink, by the way? Oh, Matthew D. All right. So it's this, you know... Little by little, it becomes so salty, there's no way anything could ever live in it. I once uh, went swimming in the Dead Sea. I should say floating, because you can walk, float through the water. It's so full of salt like this. And gradually over the years, the salt in the soil throughout Israel has just kind of leached out into the Dead Sea. There was a time when it probably had fish in it a long time ago. But you know what happened? So much salt has leached into that area that nothing can live there. Not even bacteria. Nothing can live there. It's so salty. It's so salty that I can float with 30 foot of water underneath me. I can walk with nothing underneath me but water because it's slimy, thick, heavy salt water. And I'm lighter than the salt. But let me tell you, if you have a cut, you will burn from that salt water. Because they, they tell you, don't have any accidental potty issues. Don't do any of those things. You will be on fire. Don't get it in your eyes. There's a flush station in case you get that. But you know what the problem is? We go through life gradually putting salt into our life. The salt of sin. And it fills our life and we're like... I'm okay. I never noticed it happening until it really cuts deep. And then we're like, ah, I've been in sin. This sin hurts. This sin is the one that's really bad. Meanwhile, God said the whole thing is full of salt. You see, the whole world was salted with sin when Adam and Eve fell. And you and I, we have by nature received that. We were in Adam and all fell. And you and I today have to remember that we need to take care of a sin problem because you wouldn't drink that because it's too offensive. It would hurt your throat. It would burn your throat with the amount of salt that I put in there. Do you ever think about the fact that your sin burns God? The Bible says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If God's truth and you tell a lie, we butt heads with God. We, we've studied how He's merciful. He's faithful. He keeps His word. We, we've studied how God is a giver, not a thief, not a taker. He's not thinking 
evil thoughts, he's benevolent, he's a giver. And yet you and I think mean thoughts. And meanwhile, the sin just adds up. Just like a credit card debt that just keeps on swiping. How do you pay off a spiritual debt? How could you ever fix the problem? You can't. Unless Jesus comes into the situation. Let's study a little bit more. I think of Isaiah 57, and I have this up here. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. God says there's no peace. The world wants to have peace. The Beatles might sing about peace. Hippies might protest about peace. People might do all kinds of pro-peace things. Starving for peace. But the Bible says you may starve for peace in your life, a calmness, a serenity, a tranquility of hope, and you will never find it outside of the Prince of Peace. This world can't offer it. All this world can offer is a world tainted by sin, assaulted by it. And you and I need to come and realize that there is a way of hope and it's never going to be through sinful means. It'll never be by me trying to go back to those things and finding it. Adam and Eve had to hide from God in Genesis 3 because that's all sin can produce. Shame. And here we see that it's like this illustration of salt. But I want us to turn to Isaiah. Would you turn to Isaiah 57? There's really, really good news. Isaiah 57, verse 19. There's healing. There's a promise that's coming. In Isaiah 57, verse 19, I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is afar off and to him who is near, says the Lord. I will hear him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast upon mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. God says for the one who is still in a sin, every one of us were born sinners. Every one of us were opposing to God. None of us wanted to say, well, I'm wicked. Why don't we say that? Because none of us are generally humble enough to do that. But God's like, if you're in sin, you've been fighting me opposing me like a terrorist who's vandalizing my good world. And there's got to be something done. But I, let, I want you to know, verse 19, peace, peace, there can be a peace even for you who are far off. You Gentiles, you who are non-Jewish people, there is a hope for you, he says in this passage. There is a hope and it's found in Jesus Christ. It's the greatest of all hopes. And here we see uh, 2A. I've got in for our, our point number two. Jesus is the Prince of Peace because number two, he is the perfect and only way of reconciliation with God. He is the perfect and only way of reconciliation with God. Notice it says peace, peace, real peace, lasting, completing peace. And that is what we find here. He completes us. This world is starving to be completed. They're trying to find purpose and meaning. Why do I exist? Over and over again, I hear the unfortunate tragedies of people who take their lives because they never found peace. They never found meaning. God created us to find meaning in Him, to find purpose in Him, yet we avoid it. Second thing I want us to see is He was judged. Jesus was judged for your sin, to give you peace with God. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, and let's turn there, you're real close by, but this prophecy was given some hundreds and hundreds, six or seven hundred years before the actual invention of crucifixion, some eight hundred years before the death of Christ. Notice in verse 5, But He, Jesus, the servant of the Lord to come, was wounded for our transgressions. That's a word for our sins, our trespasses. 
He was bruised, that is, He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. Verse 6, you see that the Lord has laid upon Him the iniquity of us all. If you, you can almost see the picture. It's like, God's like, I heaped on Jesus when He died on the cross. I heaped on Him your sins if you believe Him. If you will take His gift of eternal life, He's like, I'll heap all of that sin on there. I will let this take place. He will take your sin and He will give you His eternal life. He'll give you His righteousness so that from now on, you are good with God on His terms, right with Him. You know, He offers us hope. You know, one of the things, keep on looking here in verse 10. It pleased the Lord to bruise Him, to bruise Jesus. Do you know why Jesus came as a baby? So that he could enter the kind of humanity you have to die in your place. So a human death would take place. Hebrews 2.9 You prepared a body for me that I might taste death for every man. Jesus was going to enter into your experience of spiritual, physical death. Spiritual and physical death. So that you would not have to die spiritually. We look at this. It pleased the Lord, verse 10, to bruise him. And then we see that he has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. Jesus was made a perfect offering for sin. Can you make an offering for sin? No. There's nothing in this world that you can give or do that's better than Jesus. Only Jesus could be made your perfect offering for sin. Notice also, the end of verse 11, for he will bear their iniquities. The end of verse 12, and he bore the sin of many and was made intercession and made intercession for the transgressors. God's like, I want the distance. I want all the way for you that you might have that. You know, during the Civil War, there was a man whose wife had died, a young family. And this, uh, this uh, particular farmer was in, I think it was Dunkirk, New York. I'm not, I don't have the right town down, but a small town in New York State. And he was drafted to go into the Union Army for the Civil War. Well, he has no other, his spouse has passed away and he had children. He didn't know what to do, but an older man came up and said, I will go in your place. That man became a substitute. He took his place, and the very first battle he went to, he, that man died. He was shot and killed in that battle. The farmer, the young farmer family of that family, went to the battlefield, retrieved his body, brought it back, buried the man, and on his tomb, is, he wrote this, He died for me. Do you realize that's what Jesus did for you? That cross was engraved by God. He died for you. He took the bullet for God. He took everything that your spiritual death penalty had incurred. He was on death row. You were on death row and he took your spot so that you can have a right relationship with God. The beauty of that, the immenseness of that is awesome. Turn over to Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says, Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Justified, declared righteous. God's like, I want this to be clearly declared to all. Everyone who believes on me has peace. Do you remember that I said our sins created a battle, a war between us and God? God, if you would, stepped in and he died for, in, the, in his humanity. He took on humanity, added it to himself. God can never die. But in his humanity, he died for us. And we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 1, verse 2, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I don't know about you, but it's Christmas time. So I've been working hard to hide certain presents. Now, my kids are not hunters. I'm thankful for. But if they were hunters... 
they know they would get in trouble, but still, they they have no access to the presents. And I've been getting a little excited because this year there's a few little items that I've been planning on getting the kids all year. And I'm like, they've been wanting something like this. They don't even know it's coming. Some of it is what they've asked for. Some of the things they've asked for, I'm like, they're not old enough for. I'm still working on that one. But, you know, um, I'm still trying to put those things away. They don't have access to those presents. But do you know what you have access to? The gift of God. Everyone can believe. And they have immediate access to eternal life. Immediate access to God's grace, His kindness, His favor. Look on, if you would, in your Bibles to verse 6. Here we see not only to a glorious hope, but in verse 6 through 8, for when we were still without strength, that is, when we're weak, when we're helpless, in due time, the appropriate time, Christ died for, that is, on our behalf, for the behalf of the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet perhaps a, for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's nothing desirable about your offenses as a sinner, but God's like, I fix my love upon you because I want to save you. I want you to have a relationship with me. I want you to have peace with me. I want to remove the hostility. Have you ever gotten in a scuffle or a fight or a disagreement and things are tense? And you're like, I've just got to make it right. Here God's like, I just got to make it right. I'm going to send Jesus to leave heaven to come to earth to die for you because he is the Prince of Peace. And the Prince of Peace says, I can have no kingdom of peace unless the people know Know me, unless the sins and hostilities are removed from them. God wants to fully expunge and remove those as far as the east, as far as from the west. He's like, I want to remove your transgressions that far. And I don't want to just forgive you. I want to give you my righteousness so that you be perfect in my sight. Because it's never been based on how good you are, but how good he is. And I say, God, you can really forgive me and you can really give me your righteousness. I can be perfect in your sight, not based on my goodness, but how good Jesus is. God, you are so good. Here we see in verse 8, he demonstrates his own love, his agape love, his sacrificial love for us. And we say, wow, Lord, how immense, how beautiful this is. Yet remember Isaiah 57, 20 earlier. There is no rest for the wicked. If you see the world going stir-crazy, trying to find peace and satisfaction, they will never find it because God has promised us there is no peace for the wicked. It'll be unending turmoil, restlessness. They cannot be found. They'll be tossed on the stormy sea of life. They yell, peace, peace. They want complete completion. And yet, God is the only way. The Bible says in Ephesians, and it would be great to, you might want to write this passage down, Ephesians 2, 13 through 18. I didn't have time to get into this as I wish I could have. But in verse 17, He, Christ, came and preached peace to you when you were once far off, and to them who are near, that is, that is the Jews. He preached peace. He made a way. Hey, there's hope. There's a real gift of peace. It's more than a truce, though, folks. It's not a temporary truce. It's a lasting, everlasting peace for a kingdom of peace for now and for eternity. Well, as I think about this, Peter, I believe it was, preaching in Acts 10.36, There is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You see, the Prince of Peace, Jesus, came to restore peace between God and man. Do you remember what Jesus told the raging storm when he was on it? And he was in the bottom of the ship asleep. And do you remember the disciples like, wake up, Jesus. Don't you know, don't you care that we're going to perish? We're going to die here. This storm is so bad, the waves are about to bust this ship to pieces, basically. 
And Jesus stands up or sits up or wow, whatever he did. All I know is his words. He says, peace, be still. And all of a sudden, the water turned placid. Waves. I remember once being out by the ocean and the thunderstorms had been four days earlier, three and four days earlier, but the waves were still 11 feet high four days later. That's tempestuous. That's what we're talking about with the time of Christ. When those waters get agitated, the same God who created the universe, who made you to have a relationship with him, can say to a raging storm, peace be still. He's the same one who can be touched by a woman who had hemorrhaging for years and years. She had this horrible issue of bleeding. And she said, if I could but touch the hem of his garden, garment, I'll be healed. She touched him. And what did, the man, what did Jesus say? Who touched me? Now, everybody's touching Jesus in the crowd. Why did he bring that up? Because he knew power went out from him, it says in the, in the Gospel of Mark 4, 38 through 39. And, uh, sorry, no, Luke 8, 45 through 48. And he said, Jesus responded to her, Woman, dear woman, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. You see, when faith is applied to remove your sins and believe that God is big enough, capable enough of doing it, he does. And God says, peace be to you. He says, you're being declared righteous now, being justified by faith. We have peace with God. God makes it all right. He makes it all good. Look, if you would, in our, our next um, point here, he offers hope to you in the helplessness of your sins. When we were without strength, it says, when you were helpless, when in due time, he died for us. D, we see this. He removes the hostility that existed between you and God. Verse 9 through 11, look in your Bibles. It says this. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled. That is, the hostility was removed. We're reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall have be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. It's like, these are real. This is a lasting peace. This is a permanent peace treaty. Never to be broken. Changed in the record of God. I'm never going to look down and say, oh, they sinned one more time. God knows that you would sin until you die. When he promises peace to you, he's asking, he's asking you, will you believe me to forgive you of all your sins right now on into the future? And uh, the baby is being a distraction. I'm just going to say that right now. But um, all right. Verse 15 through 16. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, through Adam. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. Here's the comparison. You get death through Adam's one sin. You get perfect righteousness through Jesus. Amen? You and I have all sinned just like Adam. It's too salty. There's nothing you can do to fix it. And yet Jesus comes along and says, I will take your sin and I will give you my righteousness. One man's sin polluted you. One man's righteousness made you whole forever. Amen? And that's what we trust. That's, our hope is in Christ and that not of ourselves. Um, today we also think, not just that, but our third point this morning is peace comes from letting Jesus rule you. Resting in the fact that He is in control. Turn over to Colossians, would you? 
Colossians chapter 3. One of the problems is that we live in a world that is so enamored with worry. We worry all the time. People worry when they don't have something to worry about, like they should be worrying about something more. And then they walk through the grocery line and they see things to worry about on the magazines, or they see it on their feed, or they see it on Facebook, or they see it somewhere. Somehow they get fixated on something to worry about. Today, as we look at this Colossians 3.15, Christian, listen to this, and let the peace of God rule your hearts. Did you see that? Rule. Rule your hearts. And it goes on and it says this, verse 15, to which also you were called into one body and be thankful. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Here God's like, I want you to have a peace that lasts. I want it to last every day. I, I not only want peace between God and man, who is a sinner, saved by grace, but I want you to live ruled by peace. Do you remember what Jesus said? In this world, you will have tribulation. Don't be surprised by that. The peace that I give you is not as the world gives. It's not what they describe. It's peace in the midst of the storm. Do you know what that is? It's where you can be calm and say, God's in control. It's going to be okay. God has got this. It's where I'm more wrapped up in God's control than wrapped up in the problems around me. It's where my circumstances are not bigger than God, but my God is bigger than my circumstances always. And say, God, I will let your peace rule me. Look at this as a, by a sub point A. Peace is not the absence of trouble, but it is the presence of faith in Christ. In Isaiah 26, and I will read that. Isaiah 26, verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Ladies, guys, we need to memorize Isaiah 23, 26, 3, 26, 3. You will keep him in peace whose mind is stayed on you. We need to be ones that are saying, God, you are in control of this and that. I have nothing to worry. I have nothing to fear. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33? Take you no thought of tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of the things of itself. Don't be worrying about everything that could go wrong. How much? It, remember some of those reports that have been done, different studies that people worry 90% of the time about things that um, only about 30% of them ever happen. I mean, it's just some ridiculous number of most of those things don't come to fruition. You know, here we come to this. The word rule in Colossians 3.15, let the peace of God rule you, has the picture of being an umpire or of one that arbitrates or decides. Can you and I come and be one that says, God, I am going to act as one that says you decide this. Lord, you decide how I'm going to go. Steps of good man are ordered by the Lord. Well, I believe that. Will I be calm in Him? Will He be my serenity? You know, God commands us to have the peace of God rule our hearts. We're not, and we need to be ones that say, God, my day-to-day -day problems are, are for you. I cast my cares upon you. I rest in you. And that's where you and I must find ourselves. B, in a world of worry, you must be submissively controlled by the one who is in control. I want us to go to our last point. Jesus is the Prince of Peace because, number four, He is in control forever. Back to our original text, Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6 through 7. We see the beauty 
of what Jesus has done here for us. We see that He came as the legitimate Prince of Peace. Notice a few things. For unto us a child is born. So, what's so special about that? Children are born all the time, but there is something special. God is allowing Himself to come into a humanity that's birthed. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on His shoulder, and His name will be called Wonderful. Do you know what the word Wonderful means? Miraculous. Full of wonder. And then we see Counselor. Here we see the one, this is one who is full of all wisdom. <laughs> this is... Uh, it's something you and I need to remember. You don't counsel God. God counsels us. He is wonderful counselor. The mighty God. Mighty El Gabor in, in Hebrew. He's victorious. He's a champion. He has all power. He is everlasting Father. That is, He possesses eternality within Himself. God is eternal. He wasn't the, the making of man. He has always existed in eternity past, and He will always is, exist into eternity future. Can He handle your problems? Can He truly give you peace? A peace that passes all understanding? Yes, He is. We know that to be true throughout Scripture. Here we go on and we see that not only is He eternal, not only does He give uh, forgiveness as we've seen, but He is the author of peace, for He is the Prince of Peace. In the Hebrew, it's Sar Shalom. Later on in the Russian language, you've heard of czars before. The word czar has the idea of a prince, a ruler. And uh, here, the Bible says he is the prince. He is the czar of peace. He has absolute authority as the and giver of peace and reign over those things. Uh, Friends of Israel author Victor um, Buckbazin said that shalom is not merely the absence of war and strife, but prosperity, well-being, harmony within and without, peace in one's heart and peace with God in its perfect state with man. Here, God gives perfect peace. And notice in verse 7, the in of the increase of His judgment and peace, sorry, of His government and peace, there will be, or there shall be no end. Here, one day he's going to set up his kingdom. And Daniel 2.44 says, And of the days of these kingdoms, the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom that shall not, um, not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. No country or kingdom has lasted for but a few hundred years. Rome is gone. Greece fell. All the superpowers of the world. Napoleon with France, that was short-lived. You look at every dictator, monarch, king, or country. They're all short-lived. Our country is an example. We won't last forever. One day Jesus will come back at the very least. One day the tribulation is going to happen. We have no idea who's falling other than everybody's falling <laughs> in that time. Why? Because man's attempt to rule without the Prince of Peace in their lives will never find lasting satisfaction. And it says, verse 7, The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This is God's determinative will to accomplish His redemptive purposes. Today, Christian, are you letting the peace of God rule you? Is it controlling you? And you can say, wow, God has it all. Today, I want to bring a few of applications. Do you know for sure, 100%, that you are at peace with God? Maybe you're here today and you're like, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if I were to die today if my sins would still be on me or if I've truly trusted Jesus to forgive me and give me eternal life. And I'd like to take care of that today. If that is you today, please talk to me. Uh, please seek out answers for this. Cast your only hope of rescue on Christ as the Son of God who took on flesh to die for your sins and prove that He could reconcile to God through His resurrection. Will you trust His promise to save you from your sin's penalty? 
Have you forfeited your enjoyment of knowing God is really in control because of your worries? This is for the Christian. You're fussing, you're fretting, you're fuming, you're irritable, you're pressured, and you're letting it get to you. Christian, let the peace of God rule your hearts. He's in control. Next, resting in God is to refine you and to be further set apart for God. I need to just say, God, you're in control. I want to be sanctified. And the peace of God sanctify you. Also, God blesses the peacemakers. Are you endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit? Will you not love people well when you worry? Hold on to hurts. You won't be able to love people well when you're worrying, when you're dwelling on your hurts, when you're guarding your feelings more than trusting God's control. When you believe God has got this, you can both have real peace and genuine love for your fellow man. Until then, you won't be able to love well. You won't be able to love freely. And the peace of God will not be the thing that just flows through every part of you. I'm going to go ahead and ask, uh, have a word of prayer. And, uh, and we're going to have three testimonies come forward here in just a moment. Heavenly Father, would you bless as we want to let the peace of God rule our hearts. Lord, we know we're all sinners. Help us to be full of faith in you. And that our heart would rest in the peace of you, our God. That you truly made peace through the blood of the cross of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Help us to rest in you, not only for eternal salvation, but for our daily living. In Jesus' name, amen.